Well, it's a great privilege to be with you this evening. I'd invite you to turn with me in the Old Testament to the book of Deuteronomy and chapter 1. And while you're turning there to that passage, may I just say uh, what an encouragement it is to see so many friends. It's great to be back home. My wife and I are so thrilled to be back with you and to be here for this very special Baptist Friends meeting. And this is our daughter's first visit to Tennessee. So Elsa's just turned one a few weeks ago, and we're trying to introduce her to all the best that Tennessee has to offer, and she loves Goo Goo Clusters. And so we're very happy about that. And I want to say thank you to all those who have just been so kind, taking time out of your very busy schedules to stop and say hello and encourage us. And that means so very much to us. I want you to know that God is at work in a powerful way in the United Kingdom. And we're just so very, very thankful to be a part of that great work and to be laboring together with God. What a privilege that is. And we're looking forward in the coming months to see what God will do. Now that he's given us, as Pastor Sexton had mentioned, a launching platform there, a campus from which to go not only to England, but other parts of the United Kingdom and into Europe, North Africa, and other places as well. We're very thankful for that. I hope you'll pray for us. I wish I had the time individually to speak to each one of you who are interested and tell you all that God is doing. Uh, But we're very, very grateful that God is at work there. And you please continue to pray for us because it is the work of God and He is proving Himself on a daily basis. And we're so very thankful for souls saved and churches planted. And may God bless his work there. Let's read together just a a few verses here in Deuteronomy chapter 1. We'll begin reading in verse 6 and we'll read to the end of verse 8. So let's read with reverence this evening God's word together. The Lord our God spake unto us in Horeb, saying, He have dwelt long enough in this mount. Turn you and take your journey... And go to the mount of the Amorites, and unto all the places nigh thereunto, in the plain, in the hills, and in the vale, and in the south, and by the seaside, to the land of the Canaanites, and unto Lebanon, unto the great river, the river Euphrates. Behold, I have set the land before you. Go in and possess the land which the Lord sware unto your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. To give unto them and to their seed after them. Well, I'd like to draw your attention to a phrase we find in verse 6 that is really the theme of this message this evening. The Bible tells us in the closing part of verse 6, Ye have dwelt long enough in this mount. And for the title this evening, Ye have dwelt long enough. Deuteronomy is a very unique book because in it, the very last address of Moses to God's people Israel before he ascends a mountain to die and never be seen again here by those people. And these last and most important words of his, he recounts what God has done in the life of the Israelites over the last 40 years as they'd wandered in the wilderness. And we see in this passage two very important mountains mentioned, the Mount Horeb and the Mount of the Ammonites, and these two mountains are really very helpful pictures to all who are believers this evening to show us that there are two very vital, very necessary experiences that are to be had in our Christian lives. One without the other is insufficient. Both of these mountains need to be visited, and both of these mountains need to be experienced. So with God's help this evening, just for a few moments, I'd like to think about this thought, ye have dwelt long enough. In this mount. If you were to visit London and walk to Westminster and go in front of the Parliament building, you'd see there an amazing sight. There is a war horse with its hoofs raised, its head down, ready for battle, and on top, an armored warrior, a king with his sword raised above his head, ready to go into battle ready to fight, as it were with the whole force of British Parliament behind him and pictured the whole uh, group of British people behind him, ready for battle. And if you were to go there again next year, you would see the same horse in the same position with the same knight. Well, he's not actually a knight, he's a king, Richard the Lionheart. And he's always there. In fact, he's been there since 1856. He's never moved once. He appears ready for battle and he's ready to charge and his sword is unsheathed and he has a a very deliberate look on his face, but he's never moved an inch. And I know a lot of Christians like that. They are very prepared 
Their sword is unsheathed. They have all the equipment they need. They have all the training and all of the backing that could possibly be given. And yet, this time next year, you'll find them in the very same place. Perhaps not geographically, but in their spiritual journey, they've not moved an inch. And God wants us to know in this text, there are two essential things in our Christian lives that He desires for us to meet on these mountains. The first thing I'd like you to see is this mountain, Mount Horeb in verse 6. It is the mount of preparation from God. Mount Horeb is a very significant mountain because if you look at the passage, the Bible speaks about, ye have dwelt long enough in this mount. This mountain was a very specific mountain that was used by God in many cases. If you Hold your place here in Deuteronomy and turn back with me just for a moment to Exodus chapter 3. I'd like you to see where we find Mount Horeb first mentioned in the life of Moses. In Exodus chapter 3, Moses is on the backside of the wilderness keeping a flock for Jethro, his father-in-law. And at the end of verse 1 in chapter 3 of Exodus, Mount Horeb is referred to as the mountain of God. A very significant thing as you turn from Chapter 3, verse 1 to chapter 3, verse 10, the Bible tells us, As God speaks to Moses, Come now, therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. And verse 12, And he said, Certainly I will be with thee, and this shall be a token unto thee, that I have sent thee, when thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, ye shall serve God upon this mountain. Mount Horeb, a holy place, Moses took his shoes off, because of all planet earth, this was a place very specially holy to God. That's where Moses was called. That's where Moses' call was to be confirmed when he would lead the children of Israel out of Egypt through the Red Sea into the wilderness he would meet God again here in this special mountain it was the place of God's calling and all of us here who know the Lord Jesus Christ have a calling on our lives this place of God's calling was very significant turn over with me please to verse or chapter 17 of Exodus not only is Mount Horeb the place of God's calling but Mount Horeb as well in chapter 17 is a place of God's miraculous provision. Verse 6 tells us, Behold, I will stand before thee there upon the rock in Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come out water out of it that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. The rock in the dry wilderness was smitten by Moses, and that rock which pictured Christ Jesus poured forth clean, pure water that saved the lives of all of God's people. And this was a place of miraculous provision. And what a picture pointing to the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Mount Horeb, a place of God's call, a, a place of God's provision. But notice chapter 24 would you please as well this is a very special mountain by the way God is not telling them to move from Mount Horeb in Deuteronomy chapter 1 because it's a bad place it's a wonderfully good place in fact it's a necessary place it's a place of preparation that God has his people going to chapter 24 in Exodus the Bible tells us in verse 12 and the Lord said unto Moses, Come up to me in the mount, and be there, and I will give thee tables of stone, and a law, and commandments which I have written, that thou mayest teach them. And Moses rose up, and his minister Joshua, and Moses went up into the mount of God. Something very significant happened. On Mount Horeb, the mount of God is the very place where God gave Moses the Ten Commandments. The very law of God. It was the mountain of God's revelation of himself in the very clearest form in human history up until that time to Moses and to his people. This Mount Horeb was a place of God's calling. It was a place of God's provision. It was a place where God revealed himself specifically and undeniably to Moses and his people. It was a very special place where God was preparing his people to do something. But it was also something else we find in chapter 33 of Exodus. It was a place where God called his people apart from the world. And when he called them to himself, they did something out of a heart of love for him and out of a sense of reverence for his holiness. Something occurred, and we find that in chapter 33 of Exodus in verse 6, the Bible tells us as God had dealt with his people in verse 6, and the children of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments by the Mount Horeb. 
All of the things that smacked of the worldly tribes around them and the heathen groups that they lived among, they took all of those things that pertained in any way to things that were ungodly and they took them off and they hid them in the following verses we won't take the time to look at. But then and only then were they welcome to come into the presence of God into the tabernacle. And may that be a reminder to us that there is still something called separation in the word of God. It is to God from the world. And here these people on Mount Horeb were sent this message that to fellowship with God means separation from the world. But also in the same chapter 33, a classic passage in the history of Israel. Notice with me verse 18. Moses goes up to the mount and in verse 18, and he said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. In Mount Horeb, Moses asked God, show me thy glory. And God responds in verse 19, and he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee. Imagine a mountain where you're called by God and prepared to do something for him. Imagine a mountain where everything in life that you need is provided through a miraculous act and Jesus Christ himself is pictured in that. That happened at Mount Horeb. Imagine a place of God's revelation where his law is divinely given. Imagine a place where you're separated to God from the world and where you see for the first time ever God's goodness is God's glory. I want you to know Mount Horeb is a wonderful place to be. Have you as a Christian come to Mount Horeb? Have you been called by God? I believe God is calling. Someone said, I I don't hear God's call. Someone said that to William Booth. And he said, put your ear down to the Bible and tell me you do not hear God's call. Place your ear on the door of hell and tell me you do not hear the screams of the damned crying for you to go and tell We are being called, but often we don't answer. Have you heard the call of God? Have you been separated unto the gospel? As we've heard throughout this week, that separation that comes when God calls, He separates us unto the gospel. Have you seen God's goodness in His glory? All of us need to be at this mountain of preparation, this Mount Horeb. That is an experience all of us need as believers, and many of us have come there. And for those of us who have come there, We turn back to Deuteronomy chapter 1 and are reminded of this command. Ye have dwelt long enough in this mountain. Mount Horeb is not a mountain of permanence. It is a mountain of preparation. It is something that is in a certain time in our life necessary, but we're not to live there and dwell there. It's for something far greater and far more important. We are being prepared to go somewhere else. There's another mountain that we need to travel to. Many people believe that they're learning and growing, and that's the entire point of it all. But Mount Horeb and all the preparations that happened there were not for Israel's enjoyment. They were for Israel's employment. And all of the good and wonderful things God has given us are not for our enjoyment. They are for our employment. They are to be used As we come to this passage again, the second thing I'd like you to notice is the plan God had. Verse 7, turn you and take your journey and go to the mount of of the Amorites and unto all the places nigh thereunto. God had prepared his people and that preparation was absolutely essential. They couldn't have gone and done anything had they not been first prepared. But now that they were prepared, God's plan is very specific. And I'd like you to notice something, that God is preparing us for his plan. We're being prepared to go to another mountain to take all we've learned and all we've received and do something with that. The first thing that happens in God's plan is something very important. The Bible says in verse 7, turn you. There's a turning that happens. Can you imagine as the Lord Jesus Christ went and called his disciples, he said often this, come and follow me. And he invited them to himself. Imagine on a, a sandy beach, sets of footprints, as the Lord Jesus Christ stands in the midst of 12 followers, his 12 disciples, his 12 chosen apostles. And all of those footprints of all of the apostles would have been pointed inward toward the master. But after he'd spent three and a half years with them and taught them and lived with them and showed them from his life how they should live, something happened. 
And if you were to go at that point in time to that same sandy beach and watch where the footprints were, you'd find that there in the center is the Lord Jesus Christ and he's sending them. And now the footprints of the apostles are no longer turned inward to him. They're turned outward to every angle of the compass. They're going to the four corners of the earth because he first said, come, follow me. But after he taught them, he said, go, make disciples. Amen. That is always the pattern we find in the word of God. We are not given truth just to enjoy it. Amen. We are given truth to employ it. Amen. A turning happens. Have you been turned? If you've never been turned, you'll never make it to this other mountain. Amen. This week, God gives us opportunities to be turned. Turn thou me and I shall be turned. You say, I don't know how to be turned. Go to God and say, God, would you turn me? I need to be turned. I need to turn from my own comfort and I need to see the need of this world. But more importantly, I need to have a vision of the risen Christ who is sending and calling and preparing and empowering people like me to go. Have I been turned? There's not only a turning, there's some traveling that's necessary. The Bible says, turn you and take your journey. There's some traveling that will have to be done. I don't necessarily mean geographical traveling, but in your spiritual walk, there's some ground that needs to be gained. Going from Mount Horeb to the Mount of the Amorites is going to take some journeying. And you're traveling from a safe place and a beautifully encouraging place to a place that's very dark and filled with danger and filled with the enemies of God and his people, the Amorites, perennial enemies of God's people. And we're told here in this passage we're to travel from Mount Horeb, a place of safety, to a place of great danger. I'm always amazed at the fact that serving Christ is a dangerous thing. And he wants it that way. He said, oh, I thought it was safe. Ask the Savior who hangs on the cross if it's safe to be in God's will. Ask the Apostle Paul as he rots in a, a dungeon in Rome if it's a safe thing to be in God's will. It's not safe, but it's always right to be in God's will. And as we travel from that place of safety and security and encouragement to the dark valleys and finally the dark mountain of the Amorites, we find someone has been with us because we've been prepared. We remember our call. We remember we've been sent. We remember that rock that poured out water is still with us as we go. And that territory is named, verse 7, goes on specifically. Notice the, the detail that is given in verse 7. And unto all the places nigh thereunto, in the plain, in the hills, the vale, the south, the seaside, the land of the Canaanites, the Lebanon, even to the river Euphrates. In other words, there was no place left untouched by God's command to go in and possess. And has not the Lord Jesus Christ given us a very similar command? Going into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. There's not a wrong person you could ever give the gospel to. Because every person, third world, developing countries, western countries, advanced countries, everywhere you go, the gospel is needed. And he's sending us to those dark places. And he names that territory. You go to this mountain that's not safe. But that's why I trained you. The third thing I'd like you to notice as we come to a conclusion this evening is the great purpose of God. God has a plan. God has been preparing us. And all of those things are for the great purpose of the God of heaven. What is his great purpose? To call out of all nations, tongues, tribes, and kindreds of people for his name. That he may be glorified throughout eternity. That people who are wretched, lost, wicked sinners, rebels, haters of God could be redeemed, changed, and now sons of God and glorify him into the eons of eternity. That's the great purpose of the eternal God of heaven and he allows us to be a part of that. And that's an amazing thing. And I want you to notice here in verse 8 the promise that God gives. Behold, I have set the land before you. I've provided everything you need to conquer. Remember when you didn't have any water and Moses struck the rock? And out of that rock came all the water you could ever need. That rock, we find out, is Christ Jesus. The Lord Jesus Christ sets before us the land and tells us, All power is given unto me in heaven and on earth. Go ye, and I will be with you until the end of the earth. That same Savior goes with us as we go to the unreached places, the vales, the hills, all the places the gospel is needed. There's that promise to us. But notice with me something very interesting here. There's a progression that we don't need to miss. In verse 7, the Bible says, Turn you and take your journey and go to the Mount of the Amorites. And then in verse 8, we find another phrase that's very interesting. Behold, I have set the land before you. Go in and possess the land. 
Before we can ever go in and possess the land, we must first go to the place where God calls us. You say, what does that mean? It's, it's a very significant thing. You and I will never reach unreached people groups by talking about them. Amen. We will never reach closed countries by talking about how they're closed. But when we go to the closed country, God will open a way for us to go into and possess the closed country for his gospel's sake. Something embarrassing happened. I was driving, hurrying to try to get to a shop here in England just a few weeks ago to try to pick up some building supplies. And as I pulled up in the, the parking lot, it appeared that all the lights were off in the shop. The doors were closed. Not many cars in the parking lot. And so quite disappointed that I'd just gotten there just a little after five. And so I went to text on my phone to say, I'm sorry to the person I was picking up some things for, but the shop is closed. And while I was texting, something interesting happened. A little boy, I don't know exactly where he came from, but walked up in front of the store. And you know what he did? He just walked in front of the door. And you know what the door did? It opened. And he walked in. And I saw inside lights. I saw employees walking around. I saw other customers walking around. You know what I would have done if that little boy hadn't just walked in to the door? I would have gotten in my car again and, and went back home and never picked up what I needed. But a little boy just walked in front of the door. And when he walked up to it, it opened and he walked through it. And there are people here tonight who know that God has something for you, but you've never gone to it. And when you go to it, God will enable you to go through it. That is what God is doing. He is speaking to us, go to this mountain and I will be with you. And when you go there, you will find that I am with you and I will give it to you to possess. But there's lastly here a picture. This would just be really a promotional talk to you. Maybe perhaps just a brief Bible study if it weren't for something very, very significant about this passage, we need to understand. You and I have no power in ourselves to prepare ourselves. We have no ability in our own selves to go into the very gates of the enemy and see land possessed for Christ. We have no ability to do that. But there is one who does. Would you turn with me, please, to the book of Luke chapter 9? Would you travel into the New Testament with me and find here another mountain in this time, the promised land. And you'll find on top of this mountain the very same character we found in Deuteronomy chapter 1. A man named Moses. And as Moses is on top of that mountain representing all of the law of God and its perfection. He's joined by another Old Testament patriarch, Elijah, who represents all of the prophets. But they are there and they are overshadowed by the most significant presence on the top of that mountain. And that is the Lord Jesus Christ. And he is there on top of that mountain. And they're discussing something very significant. Verse 31, who appeared in glory and spake of his decease, which he should accomplish at Jerusalem. Verse 30 tells us it was Moses and Elijah talking with the Lord Jesus Christ. And here the Lord Jesus Christ is meeting with them and talking about what he will do on the cross. The Bible tells us in verse 33, and it came to pass as they departed from him, Peter said unto Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. And let us make three tabernacles, one for thee and one for Moses and one for Elias, not knowing what he said. How very interesting. Let us dwell here. Let us build some tabernacles. It's a wonderful thing to see the transfiguration and to fellowship with Moses and Elijah. Let's stay here on this mount of transfiguration. What the propensity that all of us have to stay in safe places. But Moses said, You've dwelt long enough in this mount. The Lord Jesus did something very interesting. The Bible tells us that he came down. And the Bible tells us the reason he came down in the same chapter, verse 51. And it came to pass when the time was come that he should be received up. He steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. I want you to know something. On that beautiful Mount of Transfiguration where God's glory and goodness was more than ever seen the Lord Jesus Christ knew that he had dwelt long enough in that mount because there was another mountain he had to go to. And it was a mountain just outside of Jerusalem called Mount Calvary. And there he would be nailed to the cross. He would bleed and he would die. He would shake the very gates of hell. He would face the greatest enemies of God and humanity, death and hell and sin and Satan himself. And he would die in the battle. 
And when he went to that mountain, he went there for you and I. But I'm thankful. Just a few weeks after he died, he stood on another mountain just outside of Jerusalem. And with nail-pierced hands, he said to his followers, But ye shall receive power. After that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, that sounds like preparation to me. And ye shall be witnesses unto me. In Canaan, in the Euphrates, in Lebanon, in the vale, in the hill. No, he was even more comprehensive than Moses. He said, you shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem and all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And when he said that, he was taken out of their sight and he ascended. And the nail-pierced hands of the Lord Jesus point to us and say, you've been prepared. You have the Holy Spirit. Now go to the gates of hell and they will open to you and you will see the power of the gospel of the risen Lord Jesus Christ. May we obey the Lord in this.